and welcome to another Starry Storytime with the Ward Beecher Planetarium. My name is Eleni, and I'm excited to be reading our story again this week. This week we'll be reading Moonshot, The Flight of Apollo 11 by Brian Floca. High above, there is the moon, cold and quiet, no air, no life, but glowing in the sky. Here below, there are men and women plotting new paths and drawing new plans. They are sewing suits, assembling ships, and writing codes for computers. Nuts and bolts, needles and thread, and numbers, numbers, numbers. Thousands of people for millions of parts. And now, here below, there are three men who clothe themselves in those new suits, who are ready to ride in those new ships. They click, lock hands in heavy gloves, and click, lock heads in large round helmets. It is summer here in Florida, hot and near the sea, but now these men are dressed for colder, stranger places. They walk with stiff and awkward steps in suits not made for earth. They have studied and practiced and trained and said goodbye to family and friends. If all goes well, they will be gone for one week gone where no one has been. Their two small spaceships are Columbia and Eagle. They are locked to the top of the rocket that will lift them into space. A monster of a machine. It stands 30 stories. It weighs 6 million pounds. A tower full of fuel and fire and valves and pipes and engines, too big to believe, but built to fly. The mighty, massive Saturn V. The astronauts squeeze into Columbia's sideways seats, lying on their backs facing toward the sky. Neil Armstrong on the left, Michael Collins on the right, Buzz Aldrin in the middle. Click and they fasten straps clunk, and the hatch is sealed. There they wait, T-minus two hours, with the Saturn humming beneath them. Near the rocket in launch control, and far away in Houston in mission control, there are numbers, screens, and charts, ways of watching and checking every system and part of Apollo 11, the fuel, the valves, the pipes, the engines, the beats of the astronauts' hearts. The hours turn to minutes, and now the countdown quickens. Everyone watching is asked the question, go or no go? And everyone watching answers back, go, go, go. Apollo 11 is go for launch. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Ignition sequence started. Flames push hard against the pad, every second pushing harder. Six, five, four. But still, the rocket does not rise. Mighty arms hold it steady. Hold it till the countdowns finish. Three, two, one. Zero. Lift off. The rocket is released. It rises foot by foot. It rises pound by pound. It climbs the summer sky. It rises a flapping, cracking flame and shakes the air and shakes the earth and makes a mighty roar.
Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin ride the fire and thunder, pressed in their seats, their bodies as heavy as clay. The rocket below them sheds parts as it soars. Bolts explode, engines ignite. First stage, second stage, escape tower, gone! The rocket flies lighter, the rocket flies faster. In 12 minutes time, it's 100 miles high. Then, after an orbit around the Earth to talk with mission control to check the course, and the rocket and ships, the rocket's last stage fires again, pushing the astronauts on. And when the Earth has rolled beneath and rolled behind, and let the astronauts go, the Saturn's last stage opens wide and releases Columbia, the small silver ship that sat at the top of the rocket. And here, hidden till now, is Eagle, too, a stranger ship, more bug than bird, a black and gold and folded spider. Michael Collins, Columbia's pilot, turns her back around, points her towards the eagle. And locks the ships together. Then Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin leave the last of the Saturn and travel on in their two small ships, joined together, flown as one. They go rushing into darkness, flying toward the moon, far away, cold and quiet, no air, no life, but glowing in the sky. On board, Columbia and Eagle, Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin. Unclick gloves, unclick helmets, unclick the straps that hold them down, and float inside their small ships, their home for a week. Here there is no up or down. An astronaut can spin in air and turn a floor into a wall or a ceiling into a floor. On those ceilings, walls, and floors, there are straps and screens and gauges, buttons, handles, hoses, and switches, switches, switches. There are food and clothes packed into corners, and flight plans, flashlights, pens, and cameras, and they float too. They drift from hands and pockets. That's why there's Velcro everywhere for holding things so they stay put. Here, where everything floats, it takes some skill to eat a meal. That ham salad sandwich? Watch the crumbs. Soup? It comes in a bag, dry as dust. Fix the bag to the water gun, fill it, mix it, stir it up. Cream of chicken, not too bad. Better than the peanut cubes. Here, where everything floats, it takes some skill to go to sleep. There are no beds or pillows no night or day. There is always, though, the hum of circuits, the whir of machines, the thought of where you are, and the thought of where you're going. And one more thing. Here, where everything floats, everything, it takes some skill to use the toilet. It takes pipes and hoses and bags. And there's no fresh air outside the window. After a week, this small home will not smell so good. This is not why anyone wants to be an astronaut. But still ahead, there is the moon. Cold and quiet, no air, no life, but glowing in the sky. Glowing and growing, it takes them in. It pulls them close. At the moon, Collins stays in Columbia, high above, a single circling soul. Armstrong and Aldrin leave an eagle and take it low and lower. They have just enough time and just enough fuel. They have a plan and a place to land, a chosen safe site among the 
craters. Now, friends and strangers, in the distance down below, stay up late, get up early, and stop as one to watch and wait. There are only maps and models to see. There is no camera that can show the landing far away. But what strange sounds there are to hear. Whistles, beeps, and static. Weird new words and quick clipped news of altitudes and speeds leaping across the dark between mission control and the men who are taking the eagle to land on the moon, who are going where no one has been. On board Eagle, Aldrin calls out information while Armstrong steers the ship. They fly lower and lower, looking, looking for their landing site. But now Eagle, they see, has flown too far. They are miles from where they mean to be. And below their small and spindly ship, they see no level place, only broken stone and rock, only shadows in deep craters on the great and growing moon. And inside Eagle, alarms light up, warnings that come in numbers and codes not even the astronauts know. But go, go, says Mission Control. Eagle, Houston, your go for landing. Far from home and far from help, still steady, steady the astronauts fly as time and fuel are running out. Then there, clean and flat, not too far, 60 seconds left, Armstrong fires the rockets. Eagle slows and lower goes until a spray of dust, a bloom of moon, flowers up around her. Slow and slower, low and lower, low and lower, landing. And far away, where friends and strangers lean to listen, where friends and strangers lean to hear, there comes a distant voice, Armstrong, calling from the moon, calm as a man who just parked a car. Houston, he says, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Armstrong is calm, but on earth they cheer. Then Armstrong and Aldrin climb down from the eagle in heavy gloves in large round helmets, in suits not made for earth. In suits made for the moon, here below, all around them. Cold and quiet, no air, but life, there is life, on the strange and silent, magnificent moon. Armstrong and Aldrin walk its rough, wide places. They step, they hop, as light as boys, they lope, they leap. In the dust and stone beneath their feet, no seed has ever grown, no root has ever reached. Still, secrets wait there. The story of the moon. Where did it come from? How old is it? What is it made of? Not green cheese. In the sky above their heads, the sun is strong and shining. This is daytime here on the moon. It doesn't look like a day back home, without any air to scatter the light and make the sky turn blue. The view from here is straight into space, and the sky is a bottomless black. Bottomless black without even stars to see, for the light is so bright shining down from the sun, bouncing up off the moon, the stars are outshone, and all of them stay hidden. But in that black and starless sky. High above, there is the earth. Rushing oceans, racing clouds, swaying fields and forests. Family, friends, and strangers. Everyone you've ever known. Everyone you might. The good and lonely earth glowing in the sky.
Now it's midnight in Houston at Mission Control, and that's how it feels to the astronauts, too. And what time is it here on the moon? That's a harder question. Armstrong and Aldrin climb back into Eagle. It's time to sleep, or at least to try. But it's cold here in Eagle, and it's crowded and loud. And now Eagle's air is full of dust, full of the dust of the moon. It was carried in on suits and boots, and now it gets in the astronauts' noses. It smells like damp ashes, like a fire put out. The astronauts keep their helmets on to keep from breathing in dust. Armstrong climbs up on the engine, and Aldrin curls up on the floor. The eagle was not built for comfort. It is not a good night's sleep. It is barely even rest. Still, the hours go by, and then, rested or not, it's time to go. Eagle's landing stage becomes a launch pad, and three, two, one. Armstrong and Aldrin fly the top of the Eagle up, up, up from the moon, their second liftoff of the trip. High above the moon, Columbia is waiting. Columbia and Eagle, two small ships, and Eagle smaller than she was before. They dance, they spin, closer and closer, until Collins can dock and lock them together. Two small ships, flown as one again. Then hatches open, and hello! Three astronauts together again, too. Successful and happy. Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin. They leave the last of the eagle behind them, and fly together from the moon which rolls beneath, which rolls behind, letting them loose, letting them go. They carry pictures, stones, and stories, and a view of home seen from far away. They fly together, two and a half more days in space, high above the earth again. They skim the top of the sky. They slip from emptiness into air. They are flying, more like falling, diving down to the world below. Flying, falling fast. 400 miles every minute. Falling fast, but now pushing on air. And using the air and the shape of their ship to slow down. Pushing on air. Cutting down speed. Building up pressure and building up heat. Hot and then hotter until flame, until fire. Now protected by shields, pressed again in their seats, the astronauts ride as a glow grows around them. They cross the sky like a torch, trailing a blazing tail. Then... Drogue chutes, pilot chutes, main chutes, open. The parachutes catch the air. The parachutes catch the sky. They slow Columbia's fall. Now slower, now safely, now swinging, now drifting. Low and lower. In the last small piece of Apollo 11, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin return. Back to family. Back to friends to warmth, to light, to trees, and blue water. Back from the moon, they land with a splash. To warmth, to light, to home at last. Thank you for joining me for another Starry Story Time. That was Moonshot, The Flight of Apollo 11 by Brian Floca. I can't wait to see you next week.